the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. To be praised, amen. God is good. Can you say amen? So I'd like to ask you today if you'd take your Bible and look with me to the book of Hebrews and chapter number five. The book of Hebrews, I hope you have a copy of the Word of God with you this morning, and we're going to pick it up where we left off just a few weeks ago, Um, and uh, you remember that the author of Hebrews got us interested a little bit in a mysterious figure by the name of Melchizedek, called him a high priest, and uh, then he comes along in that last message that we talked about a little while ago, and and, and he said that Jesus is superior not only to Melchizedek, the high priest, he's superior to everything. He's superior to everybody. And he finishes up this little bit about Melchizedek, and he interjects uh, a little different strain and a little different direction and addresses an issue that has just arisen that he was made aware of that uh, needed his attention. And so he says, I've got some more to say about Melchizedek and I'll say it a little bit later. As a matter of fact, he carries it all the way to chapter number 11. And so we're excited about getting back into that sometime down the road, but uh, not today. Uh, We're gonna look beginning now at verse number 11, chapter five, verse 11. Of whom, and he's talking about that high priest, we have many things to say. Got more to say about him, but I'll say it later. And hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is skillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised it to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into completion or maturity or perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Now, we're getting into some difficult passages of scripture. Matter of fact, I will tell you up front, I probably get more questions from this section of scripture, not necessarily the one we read today, but uh, the upcoming verses of chapter number six, uh, than probably any other section of scripture that we ever address. Now, I know a lot of people that when you're preaching through the Bible, they would just kind of skip over some of these difficult, hard to interpret passages and just not deal with them. Well, your pastor's not like that, I promise you. We're going to deal with them. Now, when you're dealing with a difficult passage like this, a couple of things you've got to, you've got to figure out. First of all, what does the Bible as a whole say about the subject matter? Because you interpret a word in the context of a sentence. You interpret the sentence in the context of a paragraph and you interpret a paragraph in the context of the letter itself and you interpret the letter in the context of the whole Bible. You don't just eisegete something and pull it out to make it mean, and we know a lot of people that do that, that pull it out and make it mean what they want to make it mean. So, for instance, before we get too far into the study today, what does the Bible say about eternal security? The Bible in many, 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 many passages overwhelmingly tell us 
that once you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, nothing will ever take us out of the hand of God. The Bible talks about eternal salvation, eternal security, eternity in heaven, eternal forgiveness. And so you have to interpret uh, these difficult passages in the light of the totality uh, of the word of God. Now, there are many, many Bible scholars that I deeply respect and that I read after that say this passage of scripture is dealing with unbelievers. Many of them say that, well, they get up to a point of receiving Jesus as their savior and they taste a little bit of the salvation and yet they turn away from it. Well, I respect these Bible scholars. I'd respect them more if they believed like I believe. Um, I don't believe this passage was written to unbelievers. I believe it was written to believers. You say, how do you know that? Well, let's look at two or three things that he says here uh, in the passage. First of all, he didn't say that these people are incapable of learning at all. What he did say is that they have grown dull in their hearing. The second thing that he said is that by now, you should have been teachers. Well, he wouldn't have said that to a lost person. He would not have said to an unbeliever, well, you've been at this long enough, uh, you ought to be teaching the word of God now. That's not it at all. He would have only said that to believers that you need to be teaching now. The third thing is he said, you need milk. You need the milk that is here. Unbelievers don't have any taste for milk of the word of God. They have no interest. They don't drink milk and they have no appetite for the milk of the word of God. So we're in the whole context of this section. We are talking about believers, hear this now, who have been saved, given their heart and life to Jesus, but they have a tendency to drift back into the tradition of Judaism from which they were saved from. And so the author is making sure of that. Now, understand, the moment that you are saved, it, it, well, let's go back a minute. When you are born, you're born instantly physically. When you are born spiritually, you are born instantly spiritually, and you become a baby in Christ. Now, the word of God's very clear, very plain, very specific. Now that you have been born again, you are to grow Say the word grow. You're to grow spiritually. It's a command uh, in the word of God. Look at Ephesians 4, look at Colossians 2, look at 1 Peter 2, and they'll all tell you that we are to grow spiritually uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's nothing more precious than a newborn baby. Thank God today we're gonna dedicate a bunch of newborn babies over here in the Sossaman Chapel after a while. Nothing more precious there's nothing more tragic than a newborn baby staying a baby. So we're gonna look now, you can look at a couple of ways. You can look at this thing positively and we can see that here are some marks of maturity or we can look at this negatively and we can say that these are some marks of some arrested development, however you choose. So here we go, let's dig in for a minute, see what the author of Hebrews is saying. First of all, I want you to see there is a dangerous dullness. Watch this in verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. One translation said you are sluggish. Uh, another uh, translation said you picked up the bad habit of not listening. So we're talking here about a spiritual condition that if we're not very careful about it, it will invade our life and could be a silent killer to us spiritually. Uh, turn over to Matthew 13 with me for just a minute. I want you to see, hold your spot now in Hebrews. Go back to Matthew 13, and I want you to see in verse number 13, a powerful section Jesus is talking about these people that have grown calloused in their hearing or their walk with God. Therefore, in verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables because they seeing see not, hearing hear not, neither do they understand. 
And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, My hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Je Jesus is talking about calloused spiritual people. Now, now, he's not talking about those of us that are just really uh, slow on the uptake. There are lots of people just slow on the uptake. I heard about an old country preacher uh, way out in the country and he was uh, trying to raise money for a chandelier. His church needed some more light in there and so he was gonna uh, convince the church that they needed the chandelier and in that church they had to have a 100% vote on everything to move forward. So the day of the vote came for the chandelier. The preacher presented the, the motion and the church voted and everybody voted for it except an old boy by the name of John over here. And old John voted against it. And the preacher just said, John, what in the world? Why are you voting against us buying a new chandelier? And he said, well, I've got three reasons I vote against it, preacher. Well, first of all, nobody around here knows how to spell it. So if we can't spell it, we can't order it. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, preacher, even if we had one, nobody knows how to play it. <laughs> and said the third reason, preacher, we don't need a new chandelier. What we need in this church is some more light in this place. <laughs> it's just, just a little bit slow on the uptake, as like a lot of us maybe. I heard about a coach. He had a player that wanted to play on his team and a pretty smart coach. And, and, and he not only wanted somebody with physical prowess, he wanted somebody that, you know, was able to think off the field and on the field, and he wanted some intelligence there. And, and Coach, you know what I'm talking about there. So he was interviewing that player, and he said to the player, said, now, now, I mean, he looked at him, I mean, he had all of the attributes physically that anybody would ever want. And, and so he looked at the player, and he said, tell me, uh, young man, said, how many days of the week begin with a T? And the player said, well, it's four. What do you mean four? What, that begin with a T? He said, yes, sir. Well, what are they? He said, well, there's Tuesday, there's Thursday, there's today, and there's tomorrow. <laughs> the coach just couldn't get over it. And he said, uh, well, well, now, young man, tell me, how many seconds are there in a year's time? And without, I mean, without any calculation at all, that athlete said, uh, there are 12 seconds. And the preacher said, where in the world do you get 12 seconds in a whole year? He said, well, there's... January the 2nd, there's February the 2nd, there's March the 2nd. The coach said, well, I got one more question for you. How many D's are in Dixie? And, and, and without hesitation, he said, there are 167. The coach was just flabbergasted. He said, how in the world do you come up with 167 D's in Dixie? He said, dee, 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 dee. There's some people that are just slow on the uptake. Now, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about some callous people. Have you ever been around some people that are like that? He's talking about spiritual dullness. I, I've heard a lot of dull sermons. Can I get, don't, don't anybody say amen right there. That would hurt my face. I, matter of fact, I preached a lot of dull sermons. Don't, don't say amen there either. I, my, my feelings are real sick. I, I, a lot of dull sermons. I, matter of fact, I read just recently that in Quaker days, back, back in the day, uh, they had a committee of men that had long broom handles uh, with, with the brooms, and they would watch, and if anybody uh, went to sleep uh, during the sermon, they, they wouldn't take the broom and gouge the people, they would take the broom and gouge the preacher because it was his fault that they were asleep. <laughs> so I've heard a lot of dull sermons. Now, let, let, me, let me just say a word here. I wonder what's happened when our lives get calloused, spiritually speaking. Uh, let, let me give you a, a, a couple of things I think that identify how you get calloused, but also how to keep from getting calloused. One is stay in the word of God daily. Spend time in the word of God every day. Day. May, I, may I say to you, if you're not in the word of God every day of your life, you're in real danger of spiritual dullness. Second is, is drifting away from the fellowship. 
Now, I don't understand our new generation. I, I really don't understand the, these generations that are upcoming that feel like that I don't need to go to church but about one time a month. And, and they feel like if I'm just in church once a month, that's all I'm ever going to need. But, but, but look, every day, look what we have to go through. Look at the shoulders that we have to rub against every day of our life. Look at the temptations that we encounter and face every day of our life. Look at the world's pressure that's mounting against people's lives on a daily basis. And I'm just saying to you, friend, we need more than once a month. We need to have the washing of the water of the word of God flood over our souls to strengthen us, empower us, encourage us, inspire us just to meet what we're going to encounter on a regular basis. A drifting from the fellowship. And then there's a failure to continue in the service of the Lord. You know, every child of God needs a ministry. Every child of God needs to be serving in some capacity or another. You've heard me say this probably for 30 years or more. When, when, when the intake exceeds the output, then the upkeep, uh, upkeep leads to the downfall. In other words, you just keep soaking up and soaking up. Eventually, if you're not in the, in, in the ministry of giving, then you're going to wind up being spiritually calloused. Then, then, then there's, and I hesitate to say this because I, I get so much criticism every time that I mention it, but I, 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 I got to, it's inevitable. A lack of generosity with the tithe, if you're not careful, will lead to spiritual callousness and dryness and dullness. I promise you this, for every person that gets spiritually cold, spiritually calloused, gets dull before God, it always begins when they rob God of tithes and offerings. That's where it all starts. They quit being generous with what God has blessed them. And then that leads to barrenness in their life spiritually. And, and then the last thing is have an accountability partner. I have five men in my life right now, five men in my life that ask me the tough questions. Pastor, you, you've been in the word Pastor, are, are, are you walking with God? Pastor, how much time do you spend in prayer? Uh, Pastor, what about the temptations that you face in your life? Have you fallen somewhere along the way? Have you given in to some of those temptations? How did you deal with that temptation, Pastor? That, that asks me, I meet with two guys every Tuesday morning and we're holding one another accountable to the things of God. Let me tell you, friend, if you don't have somebody that you're accountable to, eventually it'll catch up to you and you'll wind up spiritually calloused. Let me give you number two, you ready? It's what I call a dwarfed development. Watch verse 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Here's a little statement I came across this week. That I wrote it down, I just felt like it was so apropos for, for, for this particular text. Prolonged adolescence merging into premature senility. Wow. Paul, Paul is saying, by now you should be a leader. By now you should be a teacher. By now you should be a dispenser of the word of God. But you're still a baby. Now, let me quickly say something here. He's not talking about the formal position of being a teacher. You understand that every child of God is given at least one spiritual gift. The ability to stand and formally be a teacher of the word of God is a spiritual gift from God himself. Everybody doesn't have that. That's not what he is discussing, not what he's talking about. He's saying this in essence. By this time, you should be on the giving end of the word of God instead of being just on the receiving end of the word of God. Now, now I used to, I used to, uh, I, I used to make statements like this, and, and I don't, I, I no longer make them because I no longer believe it. I used to make statements where well, you need to go deeper into the word of God. You need to be deeper into the word of God. I don't do that anymore. I don't believe that's what Paul is talking about here. 
I'm going to tell you what I believe he's talking about. I believe he's saying that you ought to be far enough along in your walk with God, in your study of the scriptures, in your relationship to Christ, that everything that you do, every decision that you make, every direction that you take is guided by and led by the word of God. In other words, you apply by now, you apply the word of God to everything that you do and everything that you are. But you're still a baby in Christ, he says. You've grown dull in hearing. You have arrested development. My, my wife is a movie buff. She loves movies. I, I, I go with her. She took me to the dumbest one, and I believe, I've, but anyway, I won't even go there. It was a chick flick that I should have, but I love being with her. I love being with you, baby. I really did. But, but she and I both, we, we have some people in our life, they'll go see a movie, and they can tell you, I mean, see it one time, and they can tell you everything about that movie. They'll, they'll go spend that $2 for that ticket to get in there, and it, it, it is about $2, isn't it? But anyway, and they can come out of there and they can tell you every character. They can quote the lines of the movie. They can tell you the plot of the movie, the theme of the movie. They can tell you the characters and what they're like. And, and they're, I mean, just on and on and on. They, they, they can tell you everything about it. It's like a teacher um, who... Uh, was promoted by the principal to a uh, higher position of leadership. The teacher had been there about 10 years, exhibited some great leadership. Principal saw it, elevated the teacher. The next day, this guy comes in and said, wait a minute, what are you doing? I, I, she's only been here for uh, 10 years. I've been here for 25 years. It, it, I should have had that position. I've been here the longest. I've been a teacher for 25 years. Said, no, no, no. Principal said, no, no. You, you've really just been a teacher for one year. And you've done it 25 times. A lot of Christians are just like that. They get in the front door. I, I know an old boy right now. You, you'd think, and a lot of people think, he's the most spiritual guy in the world. Doesn't go here. But most spiritual guy in the world. But, but, but I've, I've been on visitation teams. I, I've been in situations of which, and he's no further along right now in his walk with God than he was the day after he got saved. He's repeated the same thing over and over and over and over again with no growth whatsoever. There are a lot of people like that who are going over the same old stuff instead of going to step number two and step number three and moving on to becoming who God wanted them to be. I believe with all of my heart that every time that you come to the house of God, God wants to stretch you, God wants to move you, God wants to nudge you to the next chapter that he has for you in your life. We're, we're talking about dwarf development. Dwarf development. Matthew's sitting over here. I, 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 I thank God for him, but... His family and my family came from the same neck of the woods in East Tennessee. Uh, now, I'm told, I haven't seen it, but after a rain, this old uh, logging road up there that has become really a jogging trail in East Tennessee, and, and after a rain and it starts to dry out a little bit, there's a sign there on that old road that says, be careful what you, rut you get in for you will be in it for a long time. Can, can I say that that's true? There, there are a lot of people that I know that are in a rut spiritually. They say the same old things, do the same old things. Matter of fact, sitting in the same chair at the table they've been sitting at for 25 years. They, they just haven't grown uh, in the Lord. I believe that God wants us to grow and mature in areas of our life that we are able to become discerners of the will of God through the truth of his word. Let me give you number three, you ready? It's a, um, 
disappointing diet. Look at the latter part of verse 12. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He says, now, you, you've come to need milk. In other words, what, what Paul's talking about here is he's calling them a bunch of spiritual babies. He says, physically, you may be full grown, but spiritually, you're a bunch of infants. Second Peter ch- tells us that we are to grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying, get off the bottle. Get off of the milk. Look at verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now, you ask yourself, now, wait a minute. Why did he throw in this righteousness stuff right in the middle of this discourse? I I believe it's to let us know that people who stay on the milk, who remain in the rut, who refuse to grow, who refuse to stretch, who refuse to mature, really don't understand who they are in Christ and who Christ is in them. Now, I'm... I'm, going to be redundant here and, and just forgive me for a minute or two. I, I tell you, I never get over what Christ did for me in an instant. In an instant. Here I was one day full of sin and ungodliness and unrighteousness and full of the devil and full of the flesh. And in a second, God took all of that away from me and gave me his righteousness so that positionally he no longer sees me in sin. He no longer sees me in ungodliness. He sees me positionally. He sees the righteousness of God. That's who we are in Christ. The second thing I think he's doing here. Uh, in this use of the word righteousness, is that he's saying here, you you guys need to learn how to allow the righteousness of God to live out through you and in you. The reason some of you are sitting here today, you believe that you're saved and on your way to heaven, but you still got these horrible habits in your life, and the reason some people can't get off of alcohol and some can't get off of drugs and some still using foul mouth language, some still addicted to some kind of pornography along the way is because instead of knowing who Christ is in you, you're still trying to do it in your flesh. And Paul is saying here in this passage, quit trying to overcome these obstacles and tear down these strongholds in your own strength. Allow the righteousness of God that lives in you combat every one of these issues in your life. There's no stronghold that he can't overcome. Quit being a baby about this stuff and understand who Jesus is in you. Number four, it's a desired discernment. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. I underline that and highlight it. I'll talk about it in just a minute. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now understand when he is using the term full age here, he's not talking about somebody that has arrived. As a matter of fact, No Christian has ever arrived. Hear me a minute. We are all in process. We are all on this journey. We are all moving toward full maturity, but we're not there yet. I I like to say, you know, I know that I'm not everything that I am supposed to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Why? Because I'm on this process of being who God wants me to be. I'm in this journey with him to achieve spiritual uh, maturity. You understand, 
this little phrase that he's using here in verse 14, he says, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Let, Let me give you one word to take care of all of those words. It's the word consistency. Living a consistent, disciplined life in the word, in the power of the Holy Spirit that enables you to discern the difference between right and wrong, to live consistent before God. Uh, These guys that I meet with on Tuesday, they will tell you if you were to ask them, here's what they say. Our pastor comes in and his number one prayer request week after week after week is he wants to be consistent with God. He wants to maintain consistency in his walk with God. He doesn't want to stay where he is spiritually. He wants to grow to become everything that God has saved him to be. I desire that more than anything in this world. It's my prayer before God consistently. And, and then I'll just, I'll just summarize. I don't have time to do with these first three verses of chapter six, but I'll just summarize what he says. He, he started out real firm and real hard and almost harshly says, you bunch of babies, you still on the milk. But now he says, hey, listen, guys, just decide that you're going to grow and that you're gonna be who God wants you to be. Just make that decision. And then he says, and God will help you. God will help you. So it brings me now to this point. I I can hear your questions arising out of this text. Am I growing? Pastor, am I growing in the Lord? Am I progressing in Christ? How do I know that I am growing in the Lord? I want to give you five things and then we'll pray. That you can know that you're growing in the Lord. You may want to write them down. Number one, do I long to be in God's word. Do I long to be in God's word? Number two, do I desire the Lord above everything else? You ought to write down maybe somewhere in the margin of your Bible, Psalm 73 and verse 25, when when David said, uh, whom and I in heaven but thee, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't desire anybody but you. Number three, is my passion to worship God? I, I've had people come in late on, on Sundays to the, to the, to the service. And, and I've talked to them, you know, I'm just talking to them. Well, pastor, I'm just getting in for the main event. I just want to get there for the main event. They'll, they'll come in maybe five minutes before I preach. Well, I just want to, I don't care too much about the music. It means nothing to me. I'm not a very musically minded person. So I, I just want to hear the preaching of the word of God. I, I, many, a matter of fact, I've got some preacher friends of mine that basically feel that way about church service. You know, it's all about the preaching. I don't feel that way at all. Because the word of God says that I am to enter his courts with praise. And it is through the music that God lifts me to the point that enables my heart to get to the place that I then am ready to hear what God has to say to me through the word. I want to offer up my adoration, my praise and my my, my worship to God so that I can then get sensitive to what God has to say to me. So so, so my question is to you, is my passion to worship God? And fourth, do I really want, here's a big one. Boy, here's a big one. 
do I really want others to know why my life and how my life was changed? And then closing, number five. Do I desire to be with God's people more than I desire to be with the world's people? Are you growing? Maybe some questions you need to answer. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Father God, thank you for the privilege today of just digging into your word for a few minutes. I thank you for the power, the strength, and the validity of your word that shows us who we are in the light of who you are. I pray now for this people that has gathered here with me and Lord, in your presence. God, I just pray that people all over this congregation would just get a holy dissatisfaction for where they are in their relationship with you. And I pray all over this congregation that men and women and young people what would today make a decision that they're going to get off the milk and they're going to take seriously your word that commands us to grow and to mature. And God, you said in your word right here that you would be with us if we did. You would enable us. You would empower us. You would strengthen us along that way. God, I just pray all over the building, all over the building, dozens and dozens of decisions by people that may have grown stale and calloused and dull in their walk with you, that today that holy dissatisfaction would motivate them, God, to go on to become who you have saved them to be. God, I ask you in Jesus' name for his sake. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.